You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, the ripple effect. Widespread fallout from Alabama's ruling declaring embryos children as clinics suspend IVF procedures, leaving families unsure of what to do next. The nationwide impact it's already having. Plus, if the U.S. stops helping Ukraine, do you think Ukraine will lose this war? The war in Ukraine two years later. We get an inside look at the new defense line as they weigh what's at stake as ammunition runs low with no guarantee of more U.S. support. And good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are going to begin with late breaking news about a high altitude balloon intercepted over the western part of the United States. A U.S. official has confirmed a NORAD aircraft intercepted at roughly 40,000 feet over Utah. NORAD jet fighters getting a closer view. The balloon described as about 50 feet tall, carrying a small payload about two feet square. This incident obviously bringing back memories of that Chinese surveillance balloon that entered the U.S. mainland in Montana earlier this year and was then eventually shot down off the coast of South Carolina days later. NORAD released a statement just a short time ago. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce leads us off with details just coming in. Tonight in the skies above the western United States, NORAD sending up fighter jets to track a high-altitude balloon flying at 43,000 to 45,000 feet. An official tells us the balloon is some 50 feet tall with a two-foot payload. Its contents unknown, and they do not believe the balloon is being steered remotely. The military first spotting it over Utah. It is now drifting east. No word on who sent the balloon, where it's going, or what its mission might be. The Biden administration keenly aware it comes just a year after a Chinese spy balloon was spotted flying clear across the country. President Biden ordering it shot down off the coast of South Carolina. That balloon was much larger than the balloon currently drifting across the country. Its payload alone was the size of three buses. Tonight, the origin of this new balloon unclear, but officials telling us it does not pose a threat to national security. Mary joins us from the White House now. Mary, that balloon is still floating above the U.S. What's the administration planning to do about it? Well, Phil, for now, they are continuing to closely track and monitor all of this. They've determined that right now this does not pose any risk to flight safety. And we're told NORAD and the FAA are closely coordinating to make sure it stays that way. Phil. All right. Mary Bruce from the White House. Mary, thank you. Thank you. Next tonight to developing news here in New York, a jury holding the National Rifle Association liable for financial mismanagement and that founder and longtime leader Wayne LaPierre, quote, corruptly ran the powerful group. Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas with details. Wayne LaPierre. Tonight, a jury in New York says Wayne LaPierre, the face of the National Rifle Association for three decades, is liable for what they called a culture of self-dealing, spending millions of the NRA's money on private plane trips for himself and his family, including eight trips to the Bahamas and gifts ranging from the use of a 107-foot yacht to African safaris. Do you regret any of your actions, Mr. LaPierre? LaPierre, who announced his resignation from the group before the trial started, sat stone-faced in the front row as the verdict was read. The trial cast a spotlight on the 150-year-old organization that was founded in New York City to promote rifle skills, but grew into a political powerhouse that influenced national gun policy and elections. New York Attorney General Letitia James, who brought this lawsuit against the NRA, just issued a statement saying LaPierre and an NRA exec must pay $6.3 million for abusing the system and breaking our laws. She called it a culture of corruption and greed. Phil. Pierre Thomas, thank you. There is more fallout from the ruling that frozen embryos are children by Alabama's highest court. Tonight, Alabama's attorney general now saying he has no intention of prosecuting IVF families or providers. The issue now a flashpoint in the race for the White House. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze is in Birmingham, Alabama with the latest. 
Tonight, after public outcry, Alabama's attorney general saying he has no intention of prosecuting IVF families or providers. But the state's biggest hospital, one of three major clinics stopping IVF, tells ABC it can't commit to restarting treatments until the state Supreme Court reconsiders its opinion that determined frozen embryos are people or until legislation is passed, leaving distraught families with no other choice but to wait. I mean, it's not luxury in here. Gabby Price and her husband downsized to this camper van to save money for IVF. Gabby taking a job just for its fertility benefits. Now, with so much uncertainty, they're looking to start IVF out of state. I'm terrified to have embryos here. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know what what sort of rights we're going to have over the embryos that we create. The state's Republican governor says she's now working on a solution with GOP lawmakers to protect IVF access, including a proposed bill clarifying an embryo is not a child until it's implanted in a woman's uterus. A uh, fertilizing uh, egg or embryo uh, has potential life. It's not actual life. That question now a flashpoint on the campaign trail. Tonight, Donald Trump weighing in for the first time, saying he supports IVF, and he's calling on the Alabama legislature to find a solution. We want to make it easier for mothers and fathers to have babies, not harder. The Biden campaign accusing Trump of trying to run away from his own record on abortion and IVF, saying this would not have happened if Trump didn't appoint three Supreme Court justices who ultimately voted to overturn Roe v. Wade, something Trump has taken credit for. Those justices ruled to end Roe v. Wade. They ruled to end Roe v. Wade. Reproductive rights advocates and women relying on IVF had feared that the fall of Roe would open the door to states further restricting reproductive rights. They just were like, here's our opportunity to do something that we've been trying to do for quite a long time. On the eve of the South Carolina primary, both former President Trump and Nikki Haley are trying to show that they are in favor of IVF, which has overwhelming public support. Vice President Kamala Harris tonight is calling Trump the architect of the IVF crisis here in Alabama. Phil. Elizabeth, thank you. And as Republicans gather for the annual CPAC conference, ABC News contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade spoke with the Trump 2024 National Press Secretary about that controversial court decision over embryos. Would he sign a national law of some sort, making sure folks have access to IVF? I won't get ahead of him on that. Certainly, he supports the ability of parents and families to conceive through IVF and to bring life into this world. But you will not say if he would pass a law to make sure everybody has access to that. He hasn't said that. Does he think an embryo is a child? I will not get ahead of the president on that either. I'll let him speak on that specific moral issue uh, on this front. But he made it very clear today that he wants parents to have the ability to use this to bring their children to term. All right, Rachel joins us now. And Rachel, I understand what you were trying to get to there. She's not going to step out ahead of the president, who she works for, and, and give his opinions on that. But he hasn't done that either. What else did she say about Trump's views? That's right, Phil. Uh, she basically reiterated what Trump said earlier, that the former president thinks all Americans should have access to IVF and that Alabama needs to pass a law fast to make sure folks there can actually continue to try to uh, conceive and have a child. Uh, but look, I can tell you from being on the ground here at CPAC, which is this conservative political uh, conference where a lot of MAGA, the MAGA world has gathered to support Trump, Folks here, uh, they're on all different pages and across the Republican universe. Republicans are um, not, you know, universally aligned on this issue. We talked to a number of people here who actually agreed with the ruling. One person said that IVF is basically like trying to play God, uh, and he said he agrees with it. Uh, another couple of people said it's the state's decision, that the state should have a right to sort of control IVF and whether or not it's allowed. And then people who are saying that they want Alabama to pass a law to allow folks to to actually have this fertility treatment, they're kind of, um, you know, paying lip service to this issue. I'm talking about um, Trump right now, willing, saying that he wants people to have access to this, but then saying he would not necessarily sign a law making sure everybody is able to have these rights, right? Like, I tried to get his spokeswoman to sort of go on the record on that and talk about it. She kept dodging, and Matt Gates did something similar today when I caught up with him in the hallways. So it feels like they're all over the place right now and just trying to figure out uh, what is the unified message they want to strike here on IVF?
Scrambling to find the message. All right, Rachel Bade from CPAC tonight. Rachel, thank you. Marking the second anniversary of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, President Biden today announcing some of the harshest sanctions yet against Russia. The president also pressing Congress to approve more aid to Ukraine, saying Putin is betting America will walk away. The sanctions also a response to the death of Alexei Navalny. His mother saying the Russian government is forcing her to make a terrible choice. James Longman in Ukraine tonight. Tonight, President Biden ordering the largest round of sanctions against Russia since the war began. I'm announcing more than 500 new sanctions in response. <laughs> in response to Putin's brutal war of conquest. They target Russian financial and military institutions and those suspected of involvement in the death of Alexei Navalny. Russia is now the most sanctioned country on earth, but Putin's war economy has survived and even grown, bolstered by its energy revenues and trade with China. In Ukraine today... Thank you so much. Thank you. Majority leader Chuck Schumer signaling U.S. support and trying to put pressure on Republicans to pass a $60 billion military aid bill blocked in the House. What material difference is this aid going to make on the battlefield? Well, it's winning and losing. You have the aid, Ukraine will win. If the United States abandons Ukraine, it will say to every ally, you can't trust the United States anymore. Inside Russia, authorities have reportedly given the mother of Alexei Navalny an ultimatum. A family aide says she was told she had three hours to agree to a secret burial for her son or he'd be buried at the prison where he died. The aide says Navalny's mother is refusing to negotiate and demanding his remains be handed over. And James joins us now from Ukraine. James, what's the latest on Navalny's death and the investigation into the cause of his death? Well, still huge mystery surrounds uh, his death. Uh, we heard from his mother today saying that the prison authorities are trying to force her to bury him as soon as possible, perhaps even inside those prison grounds in that Arctic uh, penal colony. That, of course, would hide uh, the possible cause of his death. But his team is not taking that. They're asking for uh, the help from the public. They're offering $100,000, a little more than $100,000 for anyone who has information. And they're also saying they can offer safe passage out of Russia for anyone that does come forward. Phil. James Longman from inside Ukraine tonight. James, thank you. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today for the first time laying out his vision for a post-war Gaza. It would give Israel indefinite military control over the territory, but allow Gazans with no ties to Hamas or other terrorist countries or entities to control their own civilian affairs. The plan also allows for Israel to continue controlling buffer zones they've established along Gaza's borders with Egypt and Israel. Palestinian leaders immediately condemned the plan. Now to a horrific case, a nursing student found dead after jogging on campus at the University of Georgia. Police have just made an arrest. ABC's Steve Osinsami with the details. The University of Georgia is announcing tonight that campus police have made an arrest in the school's first homicide in decades. Earlier today, investigators spent hours at an apartment complex pulling garbage bags from a dumpster and searching for clues that might lead them to whoever killed 22-year-old Lake and Hope Riley. We want to stress that this continues to be an active, ongoing in investigation. The young woman was a former UGA student who was studying at a nearby nursing school in Athens, seen here in a school photo. She was out jogging Thursday morning on the UGA campus, but never returned. Police found her body in this wooded area near a lake after a friend reported she was missing. The individual was unconscious and not breathing and had visible injuries. Emergency medical responders determined that the individual was deceased. In high school, Riley ran cross country and competed at the state finals. Her former coach tonight is calling her an unselfish individual and says her passion for healthcare science and running are to be admired. It's just an eerie feeling being on campus and it, doesn't, it almost doesn't feel real that it's happening to us. Students came together at a prayer service after police removed Riley's body. Outside, authorities were stopping cars and checking IDs. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami for that report. There is a desperate search tonight for a missing American couple after police in the Caribbean say three escaped prisoners stole their yacht off the island of Grenada. Ralph Hendry and his wife Kathy Brandle from Virginia lived on their catamaran. A sailing association says their boat was found abandoned with, quote, 
evidence of apparent violence. The escaped prisoners have since been captured. The crash of an Apache helicopter today in Mississippi claimed the lives of two National Guardsmen. The chopper going down in a wooded area. Governor Tate Reeves saying the Guardsmen were on a routine training flight. Now on to the South Carolina Republican primary being held tomorrow. It is just the third primary after Iowa and New Hampshire, and obviously the first in the South. We have team coverage tonight. Our Rachel Scott is there, and we will get context from ABC's contributors, Elsie Granderson and Sarah Isger. We start with Rachel Scott, who joins us now from South Carolina. Rachel, Nikki Haley's own campaign manager acknowledged today that the campaign faces a, quote, uphill battle. But the campaign at the same time also confirmed it launched a seven-figure ad buy on national cable just ahead of Super Tuesday. So what's the strategy here? Yeah, in Shortville, it is to keep going. The campaign insists that she is in this race through Super Tuesday. But look, they are acknowledging that the odds are stacked against them here. This is Nikki Haley's home state. She's here campaigning in her own backyard, pitching Republicans who elected her governor twice in this state. But still, she is trailing Donald Trump by more than 30 points in South Carolina. And the former president has barely even been here. He's campaigned here far less than her. In fact, he he hasn't even held a single campaign event in this week until now. He just touched down in the state trying to rally supporters just 24 hours out from the state's primary. And Nikki Haley's closing argument is that she's the only Republican that could defeat President Biden in November. She repeatedly points to these polls that shows this head-to-head -head matchup with her and President Biden, where she slightly edges out President Biden in those polls. The only issue for Haley is that she has to get through Donald Trump first, and she cannot name a single state that she can win. The reality is, is that the more states that she loses, the harder it is going to get for her to clinch the Republican nomination. So at this point, it's unclear exactly what her end game is here. Bill. All right. Rachel Scott from South Carolina. Rachel, thank you. Joining us now is ABC News political contributor Sarah Isger. Sarah, Nikki Haley is staying in the race. Polls in her home state we've been watching, you've been watching, they aren't favoring her. But some have even said it's maybe admirable that she's not playing by traditional rules, especially during these non-traditional times. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, certainly you talk to the Haley campaign and they'll tell you that, uh, no, they don't think they're going to win South Carolina, but they're in this for the long haul. Of course, there's other things going on in this race that are changing the dynamic in the primary. For example, Donald Trump is set to start a criminal trial in New York on March 25th. So in that sense, it's not totally surprising that the Haley team thinks maybe they should wait around and see what happens. What impact, I'm curious, if any, do you think that Haley's comments regarding the IVF ruling in Alabama might have going into tomorrow? Obviously, as you know, a female candidate, I think Haley has a lot of credibility on this issue with voters. We've seen her talk about abortion before in a way that was very popular, at least according to polls of Republican primary voters. But at the same time, we also had Donald Trump come out and say that he supports IVF, and that may blunt any effort to draw a distinction between the two candidates. So some voters in South Carolina have told us something that we've actually heard from former Trump voters. They say they don't want another go at it with Trump. So I'm looking ahead a few weeks to Super Tuesday. I'm wondering if you think that will carry into Super Tuesday. Again, it's hard to say that Nikki Haley even will win any specific state on Super Tuesday. She is that far behind Donald Trump. What will change this race is something, frankly, outside of the Haley campaign's control, something having to do with Trump's legal problems, potentially uh, Joe Biden maybe not being in the race. You know, the latest poll had Nikki Haley up 18 points against Joe Biden versus the head-to-head -head matchups with Donald Trump, which show Donald Trump sometimes ahead, but within the margin of error, uh, potentially. And so if that hasn't changed this race for Nikki Haley to be able to make that electability argument to Republican primary voters, it's hard to see what is in her control that she can really say in the run-up to Super Tuesday. All right, well, we will continue to listen to what she does say as she continues to stay in the race. Sarah Isger, thanks so much.
A quarter of South Carolina's electorate is black, and though a hefty majority lean Democrat, South Carolina does have an open primary system, meaning many black voters can conceivably participate in tomorrow's Republican primary as long as they didn't vote in the Democratic primary earlier this month. Joining us now is ABC News contributor LZ Granderson. LZ, it's good to see you, as always. I want to break down how this goes, because when Haley was governor, right, of South Carolina, she did remedy some historical wrongs, like uh, most famously signing legislation to have the Confederate flag taken down at the state capitol, but has stumbled a bit during the election season. I'm wondering, do you think that will translate into votes for Haley? You know, I, I smiled when you mentioned Haley, you know, writing some of the wrongs of South Carolina's past, because she has done a very good job of rebranding herself as someone who was uh, involved in taking the flag down. But it doesn't take very much, uh, you know, research to find that she actually has defended the flag quite often. She was an elected official in South Carolina as early as 2004. There was a ban by the NCAA for having any championships being held in the state because of the Confederate flag. And you can't seem to find anything from Nikki Haley from back then confessing that she wanted the flag being brought down. In fact, a year before she brought the flag down, she actually was defending the flag being up, saying no CEO had complained about it. So she's done a, a very good job of rebranding herself around that one issue. But the reality is, is that the black voters in South Carolina have not forgotten her record. Yeah, and I think most recently then there was the when she was asked the cause of the Civil War and, and she failed at first to say slavery. Um, let's move on from that. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott has been traveling with former President Trump uh, and is rumored to be a potential pick for vice president. I'm wondering if you think black voters in the state are worried uh, or rather excited about that prospect. And could this hurt Haley in her home state even more? I mean, we're looking at the numbers and she is down quite a bit. But do you think Tim Scott's support of President Trump hurts her? Um, I'm sure his uh, support hurts her with a certain kind of voter. But his influence with black voters, I think, is quite questionable considering you know, he hasn't been able to drum up a lot of black interest for himself, let alone be able to be in position to actually endorse anyone with the blessings of the black community as a whole. Thinking ahead to the general with me, let's assume it's Biden Trump. It's that rematch that even the overwhelming number of polls uh, show that people don't want to see. But if that is what happens, is black support in South Carolina for President Biden as strong today as, say, it was in 2020? No. No, Biden's support with black voters isn't as strong today anywhere as it was in 2020, uh, in large part because 2020 was a very special and unique year when you think about everything that we had going on. George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, COVID, and Trump. There was a lot to drum up on numbers, and I don't think it's necessarily fair to expect the numbers for any candidate to reach those heights because of everything that was going on. But with that being said, the Biden administration does have a lot of work to do still because there are a lot of black voters who are disappointed with what the administration has been able to do specifically for black voters. Yeah, and that's something that the campaign needs to be keenly aware of. LZ Granderson, LZ, thanks so much. Always good to see you. Thanks for having me, Phil. The family of a non-binary teenager is mourning after their child was attacked at an Oklahoma school on February 7th and died a day later. Vigils for Next Benedict, a 16-year-old who identified as non-binary, are being held this weekend. Next's family saying in a statement to ABC that they, quote, know all too well the devastating effects of bullying and school violence and pray for meaningful change, adding that the tragedy was preventable. For the first time in more than 50 years, an American spacecraft has landed on the surface of the moon. Built by the Houston-based company Intuitive Machines, the spacecraft, named Odysseus, landed on the moon's surface Thursday night, but not without a little bit of trouble. NASA says Odysseus tipped over upon landing after possibly hitting a rock. The lander has released one image so far, taken about six miles above a crater near the moon's south pole. Nicknamed Odie, it's the first ever commercial landing on the moon. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a deep dive into campaign fundraising and what it tells us about the race for the White House. But next, it's been two years since Russia invaded Ukraine, and with Western support in doubt, prospects for defeating the Kremlin are too. Whenever news breaks, 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. You have another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Welcome back. This weekend will mark two years since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It has led to a refugee crisis and hundreds of thousands dead on the battlefield. A former ambassador to Ukraine will join us to discuss strategy and the high stakes for the future. But we begin with Patrick Rievel, who has a look at the state of the war in tonight's Prime Focus. Two years ago, Russian forces poured over Ukraine's northern border driving through here towards Kyiv in their failed attempt to seize the capital. Now, Ukraine is constructing an elaborate new defense line along its northern frontier. Workers putting down barbed wire, digging networks of trenches and bunkers. So these are tank traps yeah. and to stop infantry as well, the barbed wire. And then there's another line over there. Ukrainian officials say a renewed Russian drive on Kyiv is unrealistic. But as the war reaches its second anniversary, Ukraine is digging in, with its prospects in the war now more worrying than at any other time since the start of the invasion. Ukraine is building fortifications like this all along its northern border. Not just on the northern border, but all over the country, because it's trying to prepare for a potentially long defense. Hopes that were born of Ukraine's astonishing resistance have turned to anxiety as American aid falters and Russia is once again on the offensive. For much of the last year, Ukraine and the West allowed themselves to dream that a Ukrainian counteroffensive armed with Western weapons could inflict a stunning blow on the Kremlin. The counteroffensive launched in June, liberating a small string of villages. We're here in the village of Neskuchna that was liberated by Ukrainian troops a few weeks ago. Almost every building in this village is damaged. You can see though over here, the Ukrainian flag is now flying. But that was all the counteroffensive managed. It advanced only a few miles, unable to break through the dense defense lines and minefields Russia had prepared. The war was still putting intense pressure on Russia. In June, Yevgeny Prigozhin, leader of the Wagner mercenary group, mutinied, marching on Moscow. But Prigozhin's mutiny also failed. Within two months, he would be dead, killed by a bomb that brought down his plane. And since last fall, the war has shifted in Putin's favor. Moscow has now drafted hundreds of thousands of new troops. It has sourced ammunition and weapons from Iran and North Korea, according to Ukrainian and US officials, while adapting to Western sanctions. Meanwhile, Ukraine's Western support faltered. 
Far-right Republicans, encouraged by Donald Trump, are blocking new aid packages. A bipartisan majority in the Senate forced through a new $60.1 billion package in February. But the Republican Speaker Mike Johnson is refusing to bring the bill to a vote in the House. President Biden and Republicans and Democrats who support more aid now looking at mechanisms for forcing a vote, believing it will pass if it can reach the floor. The White House today unveiling sweeping new sanctions targeting Russia to mark the anniversary. But with US funding now run out, Ukrainian troops are now facing increasingly dangerous ammunition shortages. Russia is pressing its advantage, last week finally capturing the key eastern city of Avdivka. Russia still suffering tens of thousands of casualties, more than 300,000 Russian soldiers now dead or wounded, according to Western intelligence estimates. But Ukraine too estimated to have lost more than 100,000 troops. President Zelensky this week in a Fox News interview saying Ukraine will never surrender, but no US aid will mean far more dead. So will Ukrainians survive without Congress support? Of course, but not all of us. And if we understand this price, if the world is ready for this, okay, you will see it, but it's tragedy. And you will see that they will go. Putin will never stay, will never stop. He will go through Eastern Europe uh, because he wants it. Putin is projecting confidence, this week flying in a bomber. Putin saying the US should force Ukraine to negotiate on his terms. European countries too are now alarmed, fearful and emboldened Putin could threaten NATO. The question looming over everything, Will the U.S. continue to stand with Ukraine or not? If the U.S. stops helping Ukraine, do you think Ukraine will lose this war? In any case, we don't have a choice. We are fighting for our survival. Either we will win or we will not be in Ukraine. And that is one thing that for sure remains unchanged since the beginning of this, the resolve of the Ukrainian people. Patrick joins us now from Kyiv. Patrick, you were there in Kyiv two years ago on the night of that invasion. What does it feel like there now compared to that night? Hi, Phil. Yeah, it's been two years since that terrible night, and I've been walking around the center of Kyiv and really just sort of noticing the amazing difference because I remember how completely silent and dark Kyiv was that night. We watched the first missile strikes from this balcony, and now Kyiv is completely different. You know, normal life has returned to an enormous degree here. You know, restaurants are working, there's traffic on the street, there are people. And that's an extraordinary symbol of, you know, the normality and how much that Ukraine has achieved in driving back Russia. But the war really does hang over everything still. You know, just a little while ago, we had an air raid siren here. There have been airstrikes in other places around the country. And at the front line, the war is perhaps the most intense there has ever been. And I think, you know, as we cross um, over this second anniversary, the war now is, you know, at the most uncertain point that it's been for Ukraine since the full-scale invasion began. And with USA deadlocked in, in Congress, Ukrainian forces are now really low on ammunition. And the war is tipping back towards Russia, which is pressing huge offensives in the south and in the east. I mean, European countries are starting to wake up now urgently to the danger, trying to raise more ammunition, but they can't fill the gap that is left by the US. And so what is decided in Congress in the coming weeks is really going to play a decisive role in deciding the future of this country. Phil. Yeah, crucial decisions with the eyes of the world on them. Patrick Rievel from Kyiv. Patrick, thanks. So as Russia's invasion of Ukraine wears on, support in the form of ammunition and weapons is dwindling a bit, including from the United States. For the broader implications of this war, now entering its third year, we're joined by the former ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor. Sir, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate you taking time tonight. Uh, I'm curious, we know the U.S. has supplied roughly $45 billion, somewhere in that range, to support Ukraine, uh, but they're still not matching Russian military might. So what would happen in your assessment if Congress doesn't pass another package? If Congress doesn't pass another package, the Ukrainians will have a very hard time holding the Russians back. We can see that right now, Phil. We can see that in Avdivka, um, where the, the Ukrainians have had to had to crank back on, on their artillery firing to defend themselves because they don't have the shells. The, the Russians are able to push, and they were able to push the Ukrainians out of Avdivka. 
So we're seeing it right now. That's the kind of thing that will unfortunately happen if the United States doesn't come through with the support that it's promised. Can we talk a little bit about why this conflict is so important to the United States and here at home, what the stakes are globally and what specific impacts we could feel here at home if Russia wins this war. There's obviously a fear uh, that, that, that a NATO ally could be next. Exactly right, exactly right. So if the Russians get all the way to the border of NATO, we know they're already on the border of NATO in the Baltic states, but if they get to Poland, they get to Romania, if they get to Slovakia, um, and they are looking across the border at U.S. troops, NATO troops, U.S. troops right there on the border. And the Russians have indicated, have demonstrated over time, over decades, over centuries that they don't stop. This is what President Zelensky just said. They don't stop. And if that happens, that is a real threat to the United States security. It's a threat to our soldiers. So that's what's at stake right here, right now. Yeah, that, that would then be, in, in effect, boots on the ground because of Article 5 uh, in the United Nations. One nation is attacked, they're all attacked. Um, at the UN uh, General Assembly, met today, number of speeches, representatives from 64 countries expressed their support for Ukraine, but they can't make any binding resolutions. So what role does diplomacy play really at this point, or will this all be decided on the battlefield? A lot will be decided on the battlefield, there's no doubt about it. Um, however, um, it is important that the Ukrainians do what they're trying to do now is build support, build support for their peace plan. They've got a peace formula. They know what they're trying to do, and they're trying to build support using diplomatic means in the UN, in capitals, um, for this plan that would see the Russians out of their country. This is the important thing. President Zelensky has also said that a lot of it, going back to your question, uh, a lot of this pushing back the Russians is going to happen militarily. It's clearly going to happen militarily. And they're going to have to rearm and rebuild and retrain. Um, and they will then have to push back. But part of it will also happen diplomatically, he said. And so this is what they are preparing for. All right, Ambassador Taylor, thank you as always for your expertise, sir. Good to see you. Thank you, thank you Phil. It's still ahead here on Prime tonight. The role seatbelts may have played in a crash in California that killed seven farm workers in a crowded van on their way to work. A new study offers the first evidence for why COVID-19 patients suffer from so-called brain fog and how the brain itself may be altered by the disease. And with the South Carolina primary just around the corner, hours away now really, what campaign spending tells us about who could win the presidential election? By the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane. Celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. And that's sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. From the volcanic landscapes of southwestern Iceland, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. The Republican South Carolina primary gets underway in less than 12 hours, and the top candidates will definitely need to raise hundreds of millions of dollars by November. The campaign's filed fundraising reports this week. Here's what they reveal by the numbers. $8.8 .8 million. That's how much former President Trump's campaign says it raised in January. But it spent more than $11 million on ads and mailings for the first two primaries. In total, his campaign started February with about $30 million in cash on hand. Meantime, Trump's Make America Great Again Super PAC raised $7.4 million, spent about $10.8 million last month. Now, a super PAC can raise as much as it wants, but it is prohibited from coordinating with campaigns. Almost all the PAC's money went toward paying Trump's legal fees. Nikki Haley's campaign raised more than $11.5 million in January, actually outpacing Trump's fundraising. Haley also outspent Trump, laying out $13 million last month. But the biggest coffer belongs to President Biden, whose campaign raised more than $15 million last month, but spent less than $6 million. His campaign has about $56 million on hand. Factor in his supporting organizations, and that balance balloons to $130 million. Nonetheless, both Biden and Trump are actually bringing in less money than past campaigns, though both are spending heavily early in this election cycle. There is much more ahead here on Prime. We celebrate Black History Month in the kitchen with a 16-year-old chef and business owner who is empowering other kids to find confidence through cooking. And Shogun is a much-anticipated new series that follows legendary samurai on a quest during the Japanese Civil War. We're going to get a sneak peek with the talented cast and crew. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland from poland once again tonight thank you so much for streaming with us ukrainian refugees here in warsaw do you think you'll ever be able to go back home we're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime.
We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. All I could see was their feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. We were definitely against the clock. How many more victims are out there? Wild crime at Blood Mountain. Now streaming only on Hulu. So the question is, what would you do? Okay, here we go. If you saw an expecting mother struggling to pay her tab. I'm just really hungry. If you want charity, go to a soup kitchen. Well, what this man does. She says she's pregnant. You guys are not good. Ooh. Will make you believe an everyday hero. Are you a hero? I'm a regular guy. Plus, <laughs> what would you do if you saw this? Who is this? I'm his girlfriend. I'm his girlfriend. Oh my god. What would you do Sunday night at 10, 9 Central on ABC? Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Welcome back. A new study explains why COVID-19 sufferers experience that brain fog. The debut of the first ever HBCU figure skating team. And yes, puppies really can help kids learn to read. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. A new study may explain why some people suffer from brain fog after contracting COVID-19. It appears their brains may be different from those who don't have that side effect. Ireland's Trinity College researchers put nearly three dozen patients through a brain MRI. The MRI showed that the long COVID patients had more of what they call leakiness in the blood-brain barrier. It is the first evidence that COVID brain fog may be connected to underlying changes in the brain. Researchers hope that this and other studies lead to an effective long COVID treatment. As a result of that crash, uh, we have a total of uh, eight people that uh, succumbed to their injuries. A California highway head-on collision has killed eight people after a van full of farm workers collided with a pickup early this morning. Those workers were heading to a nearby farm. Police saying most of the van's passengers were not wearing seatbelts. The accident also killed the pickup driver. Paramedics took one van survivor to a nearby hospital with major injuries. A group of Howard University athletes will make history as the first ever historically black college or university skating team. Most of those skaters were on the ice from a young age and lobbied the school to fund their team. Teammates say they hope they'll inspire other black athletes around the country. Definitely exciting. It's, at times it can be like, wow, how did we get here? Scientists have discovered more than 100 never-before-seen species of aquatic life thousands of feet below the surface of the Pacific Ocean using cameras attached to a deep-sea robot. Researchers were able to catalog brand new species of corals, sponges, sea urchins, and lobsters. 
Giant pandas are set to make a big return in California. The China Wildlife Conservation Association said they have reached a deal with the San Diego Zoo to send a pair of pandas to the United States for the first time in more than 20 years. The group said they are also in talks with the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. The giant pandas have been a symbol of Chinese-American relations since the 1970s when Beijing sent the first pair of pandas to the National Zoo. A first grade teacher in Delaware brought in some help from some furry friends to help her students learn to read. Students read stories to the puppies who are perfectly happy snuggling up to the kids and don't mind if the youngster misses a word or gets hung up on a vowel sound. The puppies benefit from all the human contact too. So we knew it was research based for having children read to animals, right? Especially if they're struggling readers or hesitant readers. You have seen our next guests on the big screen, and they are acting royalty in Japan, now headlining an ambitious new American TV series based on the celebrated novel Shogun by James Clavell, following two ambitious men and a female samurai at the dawn of a civil war. Take a look. <laughs> Joining us now are actor and producer Hiroyuki Sanada and actor Anna Sawai. Thank you both for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, this first us. question, this first question is for both of you. Um, you've appeared in American projects, big projects, Wolverine, John Wick 4, Fast and Furious. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm guessing, this project took on some added importance and meaning uh, because it's an American project, but it's also alongside uh, other Japanese and international actors. Yes, I, I think this is a great opportunity to introduce our culture to the world. So as a producer, I, I wanted to make this show authentic as much as possible. And we have done our best mm. <laughs> on set. <laughs> and Anna, you as well? Yes, of course. Um, to add to what he said, for me, it was really important to have a Japanese figure that felt real to me, that feels real to the Japanese audience, because a lot of the Japanese female characters that I've seen in the past have been, um, you know, simply good at fighting or simply just quiet and cute or someone who, what else was I saying before? <laughs> it, they just seemed a little, like they didn't have that depth. Well, mm. Still typical. You wanted depth. Yes or stereotypically sexy. Mm. And I wanted to show, I wanted to have the Japanese female audience be able to see my character and say, I see myself. I see the vulnerability, um, what she's been through, the weight that she carries, but the strength in the core. And so I saw that in Mariko and definitely wanted to tell her story. And Hira, you took on two roles, producing uh, and acting, and you were talking about it, having everything just right. And, and you say, and we'll quote it, being specific it, it, to quote the Japanese way. Um, what does that mean exactly? Um, everything, you know, even props, wig, costume, is a very important part of our culture. So I wanted to introduce to the world correctly. That's very important for us. And yeah, luckily, uh, we we could hire the Japanese crew from Japan that sure, who that has an experience for the samurai drama making. So every department has a uh, consultant, and yeah, uh, that helped a lot. And you play uh, an upper class woman who's a female warrior. Um, th th I'm assuming that was not common back in this time period? Well, the important thing for me was that if she was going to fight, that it had to make sense. And that is one of the questions that I asked, if women of her class actually fought with Naginata and that was a thing. Women of her class 
would get training so that they could fight in case there was an ambush. And they would also hold a little sword called a kaiken in their chest. And so once I found out that that was historically true, it was easy for me to just do it because why not show what actually happened in our history. The first weapon you mentioned gave women more reach, right? Yes, exactly. It's, it's longer than yeah. my height, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, here, this is an iconic book uh, that's been updated, uh, you know, adapted rather before people are so familiar with it. I'm wondering, were you familiar with it when the project came to you? Yeah, uh, I, I watched the original one on time, but uh, I never read the uh, novel before until I received the, the offer. So this time I re-examined the no novel and then I respect the novel. So following novel, we created the original way to way of script. So I followed the, our new version of script mm -hmm. more than real history. All right, uh, and just quickly, lastly, what, what do you want people to take from this series? I I hope that they really enjoy the human drama because it's so based on what feels right. I hope that they learn more about our culture, our history, our people, and I hope that it opens more doors for Japanese, authentic Japanese storytelling. All right. Well, I'm sure it will. Thank you both so much for being here. We really appreciate it. It was nice to meet you in the first two episodes of FX's Shogun premiere February 27th on Hulu. And as we celebrate Black History Month, we are introducing you to young people already making a huge impact in their community and beyond. Tonight, our Michael Strahan is in the kitchen with 16-year-old chef Julian, who's cooking up delicious food and some life lessons for other kids. The recipe for success is two cups of dedication, one cup of creativity, and just a pinch of cooking. And that's the recipe he's been following for as long as he can remember. Hi, I'm Julian with the Step School Chef. His love for cooking began when he was just three years old, when he grabbed his step stool and baked his own birthday cake. I just felt super happy and joyful and proud mostly because I had done this all by myself. I felt really confident and independent. Mm, smells lemony. His new sense of independence sparking the idea to create his own kid-focused cooking business when he was just eight years old. Tips, tools, and solutions to make cooking easier for kids. Offering online and in-person cooking classes. Hey guys, welcome to the five ingredient challenge. And mail order cooking kits, all with the goal of uplifting his peers. I want to empower kids because I want to bring them that feeling that I got when I first started cooking. I felt like I could do everything. I felt like the world was my playground. We're helping kids step up into the kitchen and into life. Cooking has been the laboratory for him to build independence, confidence, and empowerment. And we've seen that manifest. He was class president. He got to be mayor of the day. He's become a leader in other aspects. He's ready to cook. And he's leading the way for future generations, offering his classes to kids at the Jack and Jill Foundation of America. Remember, ABC, always be cooking. Our goal is to nurture future African-American leaders by instilling in them leadership skills. Julian plays a major part in showing that our children are leading the way as we rise. That's a great job. Julian's classes built my confidence because I've seen him be brave, so I know I can too. He's so young and accomplished so many great things. If he can do it, I can do it too. Julian is on a mission to make sure that kids understand that they can be leaders now. I want to change the world by uplifting kids around me and teaching them that they can be anything one step at a time. That's good, that's good. The icing on the cake is that it's good. Julian is changing the world. Our thanks to Michael for that. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. Have a good night. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News.